my name is Hersin Yilmaz. I'm a VP of engineering at AppNexus. Uh, I've, been, I've been with AppNexus for the last seven years. Um, spent a lot of my time working on our APIs and data platform. Um, for those, so actually, uh, let's check. Uh, who is familiar with AppNexus, what we do? Would you please raise your hands? All right. For those who are not familiar, uh, AppNexus provides a technology, uh, a platform for businesses to run their online advertising campaigns. Our clients vary from Microsoft to AT&T to hundreds and thousands of publishers that are utilizing the platform, innovating on top of. So naturally, we're going to be talking about data that is related to advertising. We will be talking about impressions, clicks, conversions. We will be talking about segment data. But in a nutshell, impression is when you go visit your favorite blog, your new site, you see a video, you see a display ad. That we, call, we call that an impression. If, you, you, if the user clicks on that ad and lands on a product page, that's a click event for us. If you get influenced by the ad and let's say you purchase a product within the next 10 to 30 days, that's a conversion that we also care about. We like to serve relevant ads to our users, so we keep track of what they're interested in. It might be fashion, it might be bicycling, it might be growing beard. Uh, whatever that is, basically, we also keep track of. So um, I'd like to start by sharing some stats with you today so you understand the scale of the operations that we have, and we'll dive into the platform and architecture. Every day, we operate, we auction off about 120 billion um, ads every day. What that means is when you load your favorite blog, in a fraction of a second, before the page loads, we take all the information about the site, about the user, about the you know, demographics, we package that up, and then send it to our bidders, and ask them how much that impression is worth for them. And in about 100 milliseconds, they come back with a result, and the highest uh, bidder wins the auction. This happens before you load the page, basically. And we do it 120 billion times a day. Not every single auction transacts, meaning that there's not a buyer for every single one of them. At peak, we see about 44 billion transactions. That means that someone was willing to pay, pay for that impression. As a result of all this auction taking place, we are seeing at peak 170 plus terabytes of data in our platform. We have over 400 ELT jobs, extract, load, and transform jobs that are running every hour. These jobs could actually take multiple logs, join them, and create a new output. They could sync data from one data source to another data source. Or even they could be a purge job, right? So you have a 30-day rolling window table that you want to purge at the end of 30 days, um, the latest hour, oldest hour, oldest day. So we consider basic ELT jobs. We'll talk more about it later. So analytics. We get over a quarter million analytics uh, requests into our platform daily. These requests are basically um, an advertiser asking how their campaign is doing, looking at various dimensions. How is my campaign performing for a given site, placement, creative, um, and various other dimensions? It could be today, it could be lifetime, it could be this quarter. Or publishers, how much do I need to pay my publisher at the end of the quarter? These are very complex analytics where we have to respond in, uh, in, in seconds. So currently have two Hadoop, two HBase, and six Vertica uh, clusters deployed in production. We'll talk about how we use them. Last but not least, we have over 1,200 bare metal, bare metal servers allowing us to process this data uh, continuously throughout the day. Uh, what I'd like to spend is a couple of minutes on basically how the system evolved to where it is today. I think it's so much, it is fun today to look back and you know, forget all the pain and agony at the time, but look back and see how the system evolved. I think it tells a lot about how a system organically grows from what it was to what it is today. And there's a lot of learnings in that too. One thing to keep in mind as we are walking through these slides is to See how a generic system goes into more and more specific as you scale. When we started, our system looks something like this. So we have, we talked about the auction mechanics here. Data served at 5 million QPS throughout the day. You collect that data, an application called Packrat, we'll dive into it more. And we load it in, uh, in, into an appliance called Netiza. For those who are not familiar with Netiza, it's, it's an appliance, it's a hardware software solution, it's MPP master the parallel processing architecture. It helped us tremendously at the beginning because we didn't have the engineering power to build clusters that required a lot of engineering resources. But this was very easy up and running. As you see in the picture though, it's a vertically scaled solution. As we started getting more and more data, we noticed that we have to buy a bigger and meaner machine. That didn't really scale with the business. Another problem was that we were getting these small report requests that I mentioned, like analytics requests, and Netizer wasn't good at that either. There was a lot of overhead of processing these small reports. We had to do something, we had to do something quick. Um, 
we put a Postgres caching layer in front of it. Uh, basically, when, when our users send a report, we put some intelligent API layer saying that if this slice can satisfy this report, which has less dimensions, we go ahead and hit Postgres. If not, we go ahead and hit Netiza. It bought us some time, but not much, a couple of months, and we had to do something else. We knew that we had to move the, uh, the stack end to end to a horizontal scaling architecture. Our system looks at a high level, level like, something like this. So our impulses and bidders, auctions and buyers, are doing the auction mechanics, emitting all this data. We are collecting throughout the day, loading it to Hadoop Yarn, our backbone of the system. We apply all of our business logic, crunch this data, this is the processing section, and then we sync it over to Vertica, a columnar data store. And then we, have, we expose that data via our APIs. Because of the fact that we have so many jobs, we need some intelligence on which job runs when. And you know, what's the priority? How do you manage failures? So we have an internal tool called Job Scheduler, which manages this, this graph, basically. Last but not least, we have a highly distributed system. We mentioned all these Hadoop and HBase and Vertica clusters. In order for us to keep this data consistent, right? So you have clusters that needs to come down for upgrades. They have production issues. How do you make sure that data is consistent? How do you make sure that when you fail over from A to B, cluster A to B, that your clients are not noticing data discrepancy? So Night Owl is a system that we built in-house, in which tracks all the metrics as we are running MapReduce jobs, as we are syncing data to various clusters. And if there's inconsistency, it alerts us and fix the issue. So what we're gonna do today is, we're gonna dive into ingestion, processing, delivery aspects of our data platform. We'll dive into it, how we do it, and also we'll talk about some of the new stuff that we are working on lately. I hope you enjoyed. I'm gonna invite Chen Song, who's a team lead in our, uh, in our uh, team. He's gonna come and talk about data ingestion and data processing. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Chen, and today I'm gonna to talk about data ingestion and data processing. So first I wanna start by giving you an overview of our network architecture. Globally, we have five data centers. We have Singapore in Asia, LAX in New York in US, and Amsterdam and Frankfurt in Europe. Each data center has an ad serving infrastructure which runs real time auction, ad auctions, and uh, in total we have over 1,000 of ad serving machines, and uh, which collectively produce over 2 million log events per second. LAX and New York data centers are our primary data centers, and we also have data processing infrastructures based on Hadoop. Within each data center, there's an application called Packrat, which serves as a multiplexer. So Packrat is responsible for collecting the streams of log events generated from the S server machines within, within its local data center and streaming data to Packrat on all other data centers. Concretely, Singapore Packrat streams its data to LA Packrat. Amsterdam and Frankfurt Packrat stream their data to New York Packrat. LAX and New York Packrat stream data to each other. So after all, both LA and New York have the entire full data set. Packrat then hands the data over to an application called Courier, which then loads the data into Hadoop clusters. We have data pipelines running in both LAX and New York. They perform the same functionality and to provide computational redundancy. So in case of failures or scheduled maintenances, we can fail over jobs seamlessly. Next, I want to talk more about the Cora application. So Cora is a data ingestion tool we built in-house. It interfaces with Packrad through a binary data format called Protobuf. So Protobuf decouples these two subsystems, but uh, still provides a consistent view of data being transferred and loaded into Hadoop. So Protobuf is also a ubiquitous uh, data exchange format we use a lot in, at AppNexus, and you will hear the, uh, Protobuf more and more uh, often uh, in, in later slides. So um, besides basic loading, Courier has some other nice features. First, not all log is equally important. Uh, Courier supports priority loading to allow faster loading of critical logs. It also 
compress data with Snappy and supports different data encodings such as protobuf and parquet. It also saves a copy of the data to a remote data store for disaster recovery. Last but not least, it also validates every log event. So if any log event fails validation, it will quarantine the event for further analysis. So I've talked about a little bit uh, about the validation. Now I'm going to show you how validation helps our data pipeline. So years ago, uh, when we start off data pipeline, we load everything as ASCII encoded text data. Uh, it was the simplest way. It doesn't need any introspection or validation on data. And another reason is, uh, as Erson mentioned in the previous slide, our data pipeline initially integrated with Natiza. And Natiza, at that time, only supported loading data in text. Uh, however, HDFS is not a right validated store. So every time our upstream system generates bad data, we're in trouble. So here I'm going to show you a real world example when an integer has a bad value. So years ago, when our job saw a value like this, the job would fail. And if happening on critical jobs, it would stall the entire data pipeline, and it needs immediate action from human to filter out the bad rows. Uh, and then we realized, OK, all we need is structured data with some basic validation, and we switch over to protobuf. So why protobuf is great? First, it provides some basic type checking. And secondly, it also allows developers to build customized rule-based validation on top of existing protobuf validation. And here, um, the example shows how you can set the lower and upper bounds for numerical fields. So this is uh, some range-based validation we built at AppNexus. Protobuf also helps at uh, ver uh, schema versioning and the schema of evolution. Uh, data is not always static, and new use cases always come that require us to add new fields. Uh, so before Protobuf, every time we add a new field to existing schema, it, it caused a lot of pain for us. So we, have, we had to add a new field to all the relevant jobs, all the tables, all the views, and we had to spend a lot of time in coordination with our upstream system and downstream systems for release. Uh, after adopting protobuf, it was just as easy as uh, adding the field and mark the field as optional, as shown in the last, uh, last line in, the, in this example. So uh, optional field in protobuf decouples our system from our upstream producers and downstream consumers. So we can do our releases independently. So uh, you understand how validation is important in the, our data pipeline. And there's another good aspect of using binary data format, which is storage savings. So this benchmark shows uh, the storage requirements among different data formats. So we started with the textual format. The first optimization we did is to use Snappy to compress data. So as a quick reference, Snappy is a compression algorithm that provides a good compression ratio, uh, but still uh, with minimal CPU cost. So by this optimization, it brought a 60% data reduction. The second optimization we did is to change the underlying data encoding from ASCII to protobuf. And this, again, uh, saves us another 25 to 35%. We didn't stop there. Early this year, we migrated some of our biggest tables to use Parquet. So uh, the Parquet uh, saves us an additional 50% in storage. Um, so let me ask you a question. How many of you guys heard about Parquet? Okay, cool. Uh, we have a number of people heard about Parquet. Uh, I would like to talk more about that. So Parquet is a columnar storage format. Uh, unlike Protobuf, which stores the data uh, row by row, uh, but Parquet stores the data in a column layout. Uh, essentially, so all the values that belong to the same column will be sequentially uh, stored on disk. Uh, because of that, you can apply uh, more efficient encoding algorithms, such as uh, run length encoding, bit packing. Etc. Uh, with these optimizations, uh, we have been able to manage five times to ten times data growth uh, without adding extra hardware. 
and uh, for you guys who are not very familiar with Parquet, uh, we did publish our results in AppNexus tech blog, and uh, if you're interested, definitely check that out. So um, I've talked about how data is ingested into our system. Now it's time to crunch data. So as Urson said earlier, our data pipeline process over 400 jobs every hour, and these jobs does uh, do all kinds of data transformation, enrichments, joins, aggregation, as well as all the necessary business logic calculation to meet our analytic, analytics and reporting needs. So in total, our pipeline processes over 120 billion log events every day. Um, next, I'm gonna dive deep into how our data pipeline uh, for you. So this is how our data pipeline look like. So firstly, we use Hadoop as our backbone. And all of these jobs are running on top of Yarn. So Yarn is a new framework or capability that was introduced, introduced in Hadoop 2.0, uh, which serves as a generic uh, resource and a computational fabric. Before Yarn, MapReduce was the only option. And after Yarn, we can run many other applications uh, such as different streaming applications. So here I've highlighted some of the most important jobs on our data pipeline. So uh, on the left side, you see a set of jobs, what we call transactional processing. So transactional processing is a set of jobs to correlate all the raw log events, and the output of this job serves as the basis for other high-level jobs on the right. So on the right, you will see a bunch of uh, anal analytics jobs, inventory analysis job, as well as billing jobs. So these jobs further process the data and they deliver the data to Vertical, our standard reporting cluster. And besides that, we also uh, provide log level data feeds for some of our clients through a RESTful API over HTTP. Uh, okay, in the next two slides, I'm gonna zoom further to get you more insights into our jobs. So uh, the first use case is uh, transactional processing. So transaction processes consist of three distinct stages, and all these three distinct stages are MapReduce jobs running on top of Hadoop Yarn. So the first job, impression processor. So this job collects all the raw log events, um, and about the ad auction, and joins them together, and creates combined impression record. This combined impression record then has all the information about the ad auction, including both buyer and seller side information. Uh, the other two jobs is, uh, the other two jobs are what we call attribution jobs. Uh, so whenever a user sees an ad and clicks the ad, it triggers a click event. The click attribution job uh, tries to attribute the click event to the original ad impression seen by the same user. Given the fact that clicks normally come hours later after the original impression, so this job has to look back for a few hours of impression to be able to do a complete join. Uh, so in a typical MapReduce world, that requires the job to shuffle all the ad impressions within that time window and it's a lot of network I.O. And to mitigate this, we generate a bloom filter from the clicks every hour, and we use that bloom filter to filter out all the ad impressions we don't necessarily process. That's reduced a lot of network I.O. Uh, the third job, conversion attribution, uh, performs a similar functionality for conversion event. Conversion is when a user makes a purchase. Uh, so unlike clicks, Conversions may come even later, days or weeks after original impression. So at AppNexus, we want to look back 30 days. So what does that mean? So given the ad impressions uh, served in our platform, uh, that requires us to search the needle uh, in a pile of one trillion log events. And it was a really, really hard problem. Uh, how we tackled that is uh, by using HBase, a distributed key value store uh, built on HDFS. So every hour, the impression processor 
stores the relevant impressions into HBase with the user ID as the key. And for each new conversion event, the conversion attribution job will use that user ID to look up into HBase to find if it can find a matching ad impression. Uh, with all these three jobs generate their outputs, uh, this, th these outputs get further processed by uh, higher level jobs to create uh, various uh, uh, reports for our, for our, for our clients. Okay, so next I'm going to use another example to show you how we run different other applications uh, by leveraging the power of Yarn. So in this use case, we are counting unique users within segment. Uh, so what is segment? The segment is a way to label a user uh, based on the common characteristics of the user. For example, whether the user is a sports fan, whether the user is a teenager. Um, uh, our buyers are interested in this information because uh, they can use that information to target users more efficiently. For example, a buyer may come and say, uh, I want to know how many users are sports lovers. And another buyer may come and say, okay, I want to know how many sports lovers are between age and 20 and 25. So for this use case, we have used a couple of different technologies. So first, data is published to Kafka instead of HDFS. So Kafka is a high throughput, low latency message broker that allows data to be processed in a streaming way. Um, on the processing side, we run both Samsung and Spark jobs to process data. So both Samsung and Spark jobs are highly distributed and memory-based uh, data processing framework, and both of them have native support to YARN. Um, and as for content itself, we use Hyperlog Log. Uh, Hyperlog log, also known as HLL, is a probabilistic data structure to estimate the cardinalities for sets uh, by using a fixed small amount of memory but still provides very high accuracy. So how does it exactly work? So um, a stream of user ID and segment ID log is published to Kafka by Packrad. So a user ID can belong up to hundreds of uh, segments, so this stream of logs is at a scale of billions of records per day. So this high frequency uh, log is then gets converted to a much lower frequency uh, time-based HL objects by the Samsung job on the top. So each HLL object corresponds to a segment and contains the unique user information within that segment. And the, this segment data, uh, these HLL objects then uh, are then published back to Kafka and then get further processed to create a final uh, data bucket segment data. And then we have, on the, on, the, on the bottom side, we have another Spark streaming loader which loads the final data into Vertica. And on top of that, we also build a RESTful API to allow users to query data in real time. Uh, okay, now I've covered data ingestion and data processing. Uh, next, I'm going to introduce John Clad, our engineer manager, to talk about how data is delivered to our clients. Thank you, Chen. So I'm John. I run our data delivery team. And um, what we do is we take the data that has been processed by the pipeline, and we get it to our customers. Um, so what I'm going to tell you about is um, what data we have, give you some examples of how our clients use it. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the architecture. And then to close, we'll talk about some lessons we've learned um, while working on these, these systems. Um, so first off, how do we deliver data? We have uh, many charts and graphs in our UI, um, such as the one here. Generally, these charts and graphs serve as a jumping off point for our clients. So they're typically using them to kind of get a start, get a summary of how their business is doing, whether they're buying ads, selling ad space. And then once they've kind of looked at a chart, they'll often want to drill down a little deeper to see how their business is doing, and they'll use a report. So the example you see here is a data table that you can pull from our UI. Um, like any reporting system, you can um, uh, basically slice and dice the data in many different ways. Um, you can pick columns to group by, filter by, and sort by, um, and then get a deeper understanding of what's going on. 
And lastly, kind of the, <clears throat> excuse me, the most detailed uh, type of data we have, we call our event level feeds, as you heard Chen mention. Now these event level feeds provide information, not at a summary view, but at a detailed level about every single event that's happening. So every ad being shown, every click, um, every purchase. And um, not all of our clients make use of this data, but the ones who do, the ones who have the um, technical know-how and the desire, are able to use this data to get some really interesting insights. So let's, let's walk through an example of how a particular uh, AppNexus client uh, might use their data. So we're gonna use the example of AT&T. Um, AppNexus uh, runs ad campaigns on behalf of AT&T. Um, and let's say, for example, uh, AT&T uh, is running a new ad campaign to get more people to sign up for their uh, wireless phone service. So what the AT&T campaign manager might do is set up a campaign in our UI, set it live, and now their ads are showing across the internet. One of the first pieces of data they're gonna wanna look at is this graph that shows kind of their, their campaign spend in real time. So every minute we're updating this graph, um, and this kind of gives that campaign manager a pulse check. How well is, is your campaign spending too much, too little? Hopefully, hopefully kind of right at the level you want. Um, and this can, and if, this, if not, they can make quick corrections. Then maybe a couple hours later, maybe a day later, that campaign manager will come back and then check this chart to help them understand the performance of their campaign. Now when we say performance uh, for an ad campaign, typically we're talking about uh, effectiveness. Really meaning, uh, how good is your ad campaign at driving purchases relative to the amount of money you're spending on ads. So let's say the AT&T campaign manager took a look at this chart and said, well, the performance isn't quite what I need. What they then might do is pull a report to um, get an idea of kind of what parts of um, basically what websites, what geographies have been performing best for them. And then what they can do is what we call optimizing their campaign, meaning they can tailor their campaign to target those websites, geographies, or people who are most interested uh, in their product. So that was kind of an overview of just one way that um, our clients can use this data. Now we're gonna op go under the hood and look at some of the architecture. So as uh, Chen mentioned, all our data ingestion, our data processing is happening in Hadoop, in our yarn cluster. And then from there, we take that processed data we're pushing it to Vertica. Now you've heard Vertica mentioned a few times. What this system is, is it's, it's third-party software. We purchase it from HP. And it's a distributed SQL database. Um, probably the number one thing we love about Vertica is that it scales really well. Uh, if you remember from Urson's uh, earlier slides with the, the fire, um, Natiza, one of our first uh, tools we use for our data warehouse, um, only scales vertically meaning that you have to buy a bigger and bigger server in order to accommodate more data or more queries. Thankfully, Vertica scales horizontally, which means we can just buy more servers um, and add them into a cluster, and then we're able to take advantage of um, Vertica in the sense that it shards our data automatically, spreads out our query load, um, it makes scaling a whole lot easier. Um, and in addition, um, also similar to, um, you know, Chen mentioned that uh, the Parquet storage format that we use in Hadoop is, is a column format, which we get a lot of benefits from. Uh, Vertica is very similar in the sense that the data format it uses is also columnar. So we get the same benefits with Vertica. We get really great compression. Uh, we save a lot on I.O. Um, and also our um, query performance is really good. Just to give you some, some specifics, um, our production Vertica cluster today is about two dozen servers. Uh, we're storing about 200 terabytes of data. Uh, our largest table is about 50 terabytes, and that's the table that we're querying roughly a quarter million times per day. Our average query time is well under two seconds. So we're able to get some really good performance, um, and, and Vertica is a key part of that. On top of Vertica, we have our, uh, our report API. Now, this API is homegrown. Uh, we built it on the LAMP stack, and the job of this report API is to take uh, that report request from our users, uh, basically translate it into SQL that Vertica can understand, runs the query on Vertica, uh, gets the result, adds any metadata we want to add to it, 
and then sends that report back to the client. Uh, the report API also handles uh, throttling across different clients, basically to make sure that no one client can eat up all of our resources, make sure that they all get a fair share. So that's how we get the reports and the charts that we talked about. Um, the, the last piece is our event level feeds. Uh, for these, uh, for event level feeds, we don't offer much customization. They're really just flat files that our clients can list and download. So we have a very simple API uh, based on Jetty that allows us to um, deliver these feeds. Uh, and as Chen had mentioned, uh, we found Jetty is really good for delivering uh, large files over HTTP. Um, and we're pushing about three terabytes a day of, um, of event level feeds. So to close, I want to share with you uh, kind of two key lessons that we've learned about data delivery. Now, like most important lessons in life, these are going to sound somewhat obvious, but they're, they can be tricky to implement in practice, or at least they're easy to, to mess up in practice. Um, the first one has to do with uh, table design. If any of you is working with the data warehouse, at some point you're going to have to construct some tables, um, decide on some schemas. Um, and Earlier on at AppNexus, in the last few years, um, we uh, thought of our data warehouse um, not as a set of tables, but really as one table. Uh, so what ultimately happened is we, uh, we created one uh, table in our Invertica, and we added as much data as we could to it. Basically, add as many columns as we can, which created this enormous summary. Now, on the plus side, this was summary was very, very rich. Our clients could slice and dice the data in 100 different ways. But on the downside, uh, you can imagine there are problems with a huge summary table. One is data size. Uh, our table was, um, this particular table, uh, before we took some action, was 150 terabytes in size, and it was doubling in size every eight months. So uh, that was not sustainable. Uh, no. Second off, uh, it's just confusing. For a developer who is looking at this table, trying to build reports on top of it, when you have so many different use cases in one table, it can be hard to understand what it actually means how to basically build your report correctly. So the process we've uh, went through and actually recently just finished up was to take this one summary and break it apart into different separate summaries, which each of which now is much smaller and much more understandable. So uh, you know, the lesson here is, you know, I think is certainly if you can, rather than going through this process, you can start up front with a kind of a more focused table design. Uh, that will save you a lot of headaches down the road. Um, and in order to do that, really, if you're an engineer, if you're in charge of figuring out this table design, you need to understand your business's use cases. You need to understand how do your clients, what questions do your clients need to answer with their data. And the, the second lesson I'll share, uh, this one's probably even more obvious, is Watch your database's performance. Keep an eye on it. Uh, we had a, a crisis at the end of 2013 in which our uh, Vertica database performance was slowing down. Um, we didn't know why. Um, our clients were not happy, um, and we were scrambling to figure it out. Um, basically, we had a theory, we had a hypothesis. You know, this, this slowdown could be caused by certain uh, report queries, but it was tricky to find out which ones. Like um, has been mentioned, we had a quarter million queries running per day. Um, it wasn't obvious as to which ones might have been the issue. Um, so uh, what we had to do, well, first we actually asked Vertica for help. You know, can you help us identify which queries are using up our CPU? We, didn't, we weren't able to get help from them. Uh, we tried to reproduce these issues in our test environment. No luck. So what we ultimately had to do was build into our report API the ability to selectively pause different types of reports, different groups of reports, um, so we could basically, through trial and error, figure out which reports were really slowing us down. Um, and after a little bit of time, uh, we figured out, we actually identified one class of reports, roughly 1% of our total requests were using up 90% of our CPU. So you can imagine that was a big finding. Once we once we got that down and we optimized those reports, uh, life got much better, much more quickly. So the lesson here is not you know, get ready for, uh, you know, for some digging through your reports. The lesson, again, is if you can monitor this proactively, um, you're going to save yourself a lot of headaches.
And part of the challenge here with Vertica was that um, they actually collect a lot of very useful metrics on um, things like CPU usage per query, but it's not well documented. It's a little hard to find. So if any of you is, is working with Vertica specifically and interested in talking more about how you can understand its performance, come chat with me afterwards. Um, so that's it for data delivery. Now next up, I'm gonna introduce to you Swapnil Pandit, um, who's all, he's an engineering manager on our team, and he's gonna talk to you about basically how we're taking this whole data pipeline and exposing it as a service. Thank you, John. So what I want to talk about is data platform as a service. This is a newest capability that we are working on and we are very, very excited to offer it to the broader developer community that's in AppNexus. Uh, we have been working on Hadoop for like close to four and five years, right? We have learned a lot how to actually run the system, maintain the system, find problem, investigate the scale related issue. Uh, I think we can do a better job maintaining that and allow engineers in our teams, various different teams to build aggregations, build report, build custom applications on top of this platform very easily while we actually support or enable them uh, building this platform. What we are doing is basically essentially creating RESTful services, user interfaces, uh, frameworks, APIs, and various kinds of tools that will allow engineers to come quickly on board, build application, will help them basically run application on the system, help them monitor, uh, handle the operational aspect of it. Uh, this actually it works very well when you want to scale development in a big organization. Uh, traditionally, in the past, data team actually handled all kinds of reports ourselves. Uh, this becomes a problem when you have a big team or, or or a wider group that wants to build feature. Um, and I, we hope actually that DPaaS will really help us out in that way. What I want to talk about next is the architecture of our uh, platform. Um, it is very simple architecture, but we can scale it very easily. Uh, we have two kinds of nodes. One is called the management nodes, and then we have worker nodes. Uh, the way they communicate with each other is through message queuing interface. Uh, and they pass uh, control messages between each other uh, through the MQ interfaces. We also use MQ for actually exchanging these control messages for any external system. For example, completion of a job, we can actually trigger events that other systems can consume and, and do additional processing. Uh, now, on the other hand, uh, we use Zookeeper for coordination of services. Uh, worker nodes, the way they work is actually they are responsible for taking the execution requests that are coming from scheduler and executing them on, a, on the real physical platform. Uh, what it allows you uh, as a developer, basically what you get is a virtualized environment on top of Hadoop where you can come and put your apps and, and data platform along with the scheduler, worker and manager nodes will take care of execution and, and handle the operational aspect. Uh, now, all of this is actually RESTful APIs, but we do have actually a developer-centric UI. It's called Data Governor, and uh, Data Team uses it a lot. Um, and the new engineers who are actually building applications on top of it, they are using it as well. Now, um, within AppNexus, we like building APIs. Uh, Arsen talked about working in API a couple of years back. We all really, really like APIs, and, and data platform as a service is built from ground up on top of RESTful services. Anything that we have in, inside our application is basically running on top of these services. So what it means is any external system, whether it's a human or, or, or automated system, can quickly connect to it and send requests the way they want to. Um, I have some examples here. For example, the left-hand side, we have APIs that actually allows us to interact with uh, Hadoop file system. In the middle, we have actually APIs that manages job in, jobs in our system. On the rightmost side, we have actually runtime management API. Uh, now, some, for some folks, this might be actually familiar. This is actually built on top of uh, Swagger. Uh, we use it for like documenting our API. It seems to be working pretty well for us. Uh, the stack of our platform is actually all built on Play and Scala. Um, it's lightweight applications. Uh, they are distributed in a cluster. So some fun time. Um, I want to, what I want to do is basically walk you through a simple use case. Uh, so if you are an engineer in some other team, wants to build something, how can you do it? 
Um, so here's uh, uh, a very simple example or a use case. Uh, let's say uh, a product manager wants to actually build this report for the customers and they don't have it. We don't currently support this kind of reports in our platform. Let's say they want to build it. Um, and the report they want to build is find top cities where the ad auctions are being coming from. Uh, now, for this to work, there are a couple of inputs that are needed. Uh, first of all, you need uh, the actual input auction level data. Uh, we have impression processing jobs that actually correlate all the events that Chen talked about it earlier and create auction level information. We can use that in the platform. But we also need reference data so the identifiers for cities can be mapped to the textual name. And this is data actually sits in MySQL. We have to actually pull it over into Hadoop. So data platform actually provides you these fundamental capabilities. Now, you write your aggregation, which is, could be Hive, MapReduce, Jobs, Spark. Um, once the aggregation is completed, you want to report it or deliver it to a delivery solution, which is Vertica in our case. Uh, we actually provide capabilities to copy or stream this data over to Vertica. Uh, we do it at a very high throughput rate, like our copying jobs actually at a peak throughput can copy uh, close to 150,000 rows per second. Now, what I talked about is how the architecture should look like. Uh, there are actually a lot of complexities that are involved when we talk about how do we actually maintain the system, how do we actually run it day to day. If there are failures, how we would basically notify the right people. Um, if uh, we want to monitor that this job is actually running every day or every hour, how do we maintain that? So data platform takes care of that as well. Now, let's go into details. So let's say here's the hive aggregation, fairly simple. Uh, for those who don't know, this is like very similar to SQL. Uh, all we are doing is basically taking the impression which is coming from this table called AgDW impression. Now, the PQ suffix actually stands for parquet. Uh, what we do is basically take the data from this table, join it with the city reference data, group it by city, order by impression, and take the first n. Uh, pretty simple, straightforward. Uh, then comes the slightly tricky part. How do we deploy it? How do we make sure it's running? So um, one of our engineers in my team, uh, Jay, he actually created a very nice uh, uh, movie for it. Let's watch. So the first step is actually taking this data and uploading it to HDFS. So this is actually a script that's being actually uploaded into uh, our Hadoop cluster. The file actually is in YAML format, but it's actually a Hive query that's, that's being uploaded. And this is where actually you create a job. Uh, it looks fairly simple, but there's a lot of mechanics that's going in the background. Um, we are actually making sure that this job runs actually every hour and there are dependencies. Uh, it will only run when uh, the parents have actually executed. And there are data sources and resources. We have multiple cluster. We make sure that the job can run on different clusters and things like that. This is where all of our aggregations are. So you can create dependencies any way you like. Uh, and your job will execute it when the dependencies have uh, executed as well. So that's it. Um, within like a minute and 20 seconds, we have a job running in production. Uh, now, this is trivial for people who actually work on this every day. but. If you are actually trying to set up your Hadoop cluster, trying to get all of this actually while working for your business logic that may be like 50 lines of Hive query, this is actually a lot of work just to basically get that 50 lines of Hive query to work. Um, once you get that, you have your output. Now, some important tidbit, when we actually first wrote this query, Fremont, California seems to be the top city pretty much every hour. We don't know why. Uh, uh, I, I don't know. Some, somebody might know this. Uh, so I want to take a detour from here, and I want to show you how Data Governor looks like. Now, bear with me. This is actually developer-centric. So you won't see bells and whistles than you would find in AppNexus console. Uh, but people like me actually use it all the time, so it, it works for us. Uh, 
Uh, so on, on this tab, actually, we have all the jobs that are currently running in our platform. Uh, anybody can go in and take a look what's running in the production, uh, how long it's taking, if the job is processing or if it has been completed. Uh, cool stuff is you can click on any running job. It will give you a lot more details about where the request came from, where the responses are. Even more cool, it will actually tell you where the job is running on the Hadoop cluster. So you can go on the Hadoop cluster and debug it further if you need to. Um, there are more details about inputs and outputs. So we actually take the logs that are being generated, aggregated, and bring it back to, to the user. Similarly, the jobs that have been completed in the past are also available. Um, things that are actually failed. Uh, so these are actually recently failed jobs. Um, there may be some reason why this failed, so we can go and take a look. So it looks like something is wrong in, in the Python code. So somebody can go in and debug why this is not working. Uh, but uh, here's another one, uh, another view of like uh, jobs. So this is the, the two jobs that we created. If you look at the first job, this is uh, the, uh, the, the aggregation that we created, and it's actually taking the city's aggregation and generating the output. Uh, the second uh, dynamic sync that you see, this is the job. It is responsible for taking the output and copying it over to Vertica. Um, and as, you, as I showed you before, actually, there are uh, previous runs that are available to, uh, to investigation here. Now, this is... Um, this is the end of it. So I want to actually uh, ask Arsene, Chen, and John to come back. Uh, we'll be very happy to answer some of your questions. Yeah, get up there, guys. I'm turning this on right now. And uh, come on up, ask some questions. Doesn't the excess number of impressions from Fremont make you suspect maybe there is some fraud there? Absolutely, that could be. <laughs> so one of the things is actually the point, right? You know, visually, historically, our engineers build a lot of the aggregations without fully understanding the use cases, working with the product managers. When someone who is working in top cities, that's of course going to, they're going to be more familiar with, hey, why is it the case? Uh, that's actually making the point. Of course, you know, someone is following up saying, why is Fremont coming up? Um, London makes sense, I presume, but um, that's exactly it. Yeah, we are, we are digging into see what's going on. Hello, I've noticed that there's a lot of co copying going on in your production systems. What have you done to minimize that, and generally, how do you think about copying data? Copy, copying into like Vertica delivery system, is that what you mean? Yeah, so just copying from one server to another, to another, to another, and one data point could turn into nine or ten, even though it's the same information. I'll answer that uh, part, part of that question. Um, so for the, on the data delivery side, I mean, really, um, the thing we love about Vertica is it's really good at write once, read many times. So um, just compared to you know, reading the data directly off of Hadoop and trying to do a quarter million analytics queries, um, Vertica just becomes a lot more, just a lot more efficient and cost effective. Um, so it is a duplicate of the data, but it's, um, it's really just in an optimized format so we can um, you know, really answer those analytics queries fast. Also, when you look at the, the data sizes, the data sizes that are coming from ad server into our system, they are close to 170 terabytes every day, right? What gets actually copied over to Vertica is few gigabytes actually every hour. So it's a much smaller scale. It's it's definitely a lot of I/O when we talk about pack rights uh, between pack rights and courier. But toward, towards the delivery side, the data sizes are much more smaller. Yes. Um, thank you for the details. It was really interesting. Um, you have so many software components there. So the, you know, everything is built step after step. Looking backward, which we remove maybe some of them, consolidate some of the components, it looks pretty complex. You're absolutely right. So it, it, is, it is part of organically growing the system. At some point, you don't get a chance to say, I'm going to rebuild everything from bottom up. Uh, it usually doesn't happen when everybody's so busy. But it is getting consolidated. You, you, know, you notice that Kafka being introduced into the platform um, you know, slowly taken over basically where you're going to, you know, reevaluate what are some of the components that um, we, might not, we might not need. So it's, it doesn't happen overnight, but it's absolutely the case that we're going to be consolidating um, some of the components in the system. But as, a, as, a, as of today, that's, you know, we wanted to give the full reflection of what the system works, but you're absolutely right. It'll happen. 
and also refactoring is part of developer's life. We keep on refactoring our code. We keep on taking our old system, replacing with the new system, do better things uh, in a more efficient way. Very impressive presentation. Uh, question about uh, the, co the stack overall is very complex. How you handle the multi data center uh, across the stack? Do you have the cluster across the data center for like Kafka, Hadoop, or do you go uh, have dual injection? What's how you handle those if you have to across the multi data center as well as disaster recovery? I don't know whether your data is important to make sure is if, if one data center fails, how you uh, get the data from different data center. Um, today we actually run things in parallel. It's, uh, actually, Chen, why do we take on this? You just talked about that. Uh, yeah, I think uh, as uh, as we said in the, uh, in the in the talk, so uh, the the way we uh, handle failover is uh, through the packrad, the multiplexer. So basically, we have a, a same data, uh, entire data copied uh, in both of our primary data centers. Uh, by using the pack and the courier and uh, so um, because of that so if we we run our job in the New York data centers and uh, if the job fail and uh, we do have the scheduler that uh, swap team showed you uh, that you can change the uh, where the job to run on different data center so it's very easy for, for us to fail fail over jobs uh, that's for HDFS and then Kafka uh, we just introduced Kafka uh, early this year uh, we don't have the cross data center sync, uh, sync for Kafka yet, but uh, that's on our plate. Yeah, to add to that, right, so you, you have a, two, two data centers that are doing exact same thing. You have multiple options. Do you want to actually run them in parallel, the hot, hot, or do you want to say one of them is actually just, you know, failover, but we will only fail over when we need to. So in our case, we, we want to reduce the SLA of switching basically from primary to secondary. For that, we are running things in parallel. That said, at some point, you say, well, you know, based on our SLA, we might say, you know, maybe just the failover cluster is utilized for different purposes, and in case we need the failover, then we basically pause other things that are not as important. But at the moment, they are basically running uh, the same uh, jobs, same data, same jobs in parallel, so we can quickly switch over in case one of the clusters is having issues. So we have, like, full redundancy, computational and data-wise, on at Hadoop level, even in the delivery side, we have multiple vertical cluster, which means we are loading double data, doing double processing, but if we need to actually switch back, our customers will not really notice a lot of lag, actually. They, they can continue processing. Most of the time. Most of the time, yes. I'm curious how you uh, approach long-term sustainability. So every day, every second, you're getting more and more data, your company's growing, so it's not even a steady rate, but computers, processors are getting faster, storage is getting more dense. How, how far into the future do you look and, and how do you approach it? Until very recently, we use a different model, and uh, we have an awesome operations team. Um, so they, they keep track of basically, uh, first of all, they, they are in charge of uh, capacity planning. They work very closely with us. Uh, until very recently, it was pretty easy for us. Right? We would bottom up, look at the storage. We actually work with storage. So we said, you know, this is the storage. This is how many impressions we are seeing, biddable, transacted, and then we could correlate. But lately, because of all the uh, amazing work Chen and the team did, uh, going to different uh, storage formats, we are able to store 10 times more data without any hardware. That means that actually storage is no longer the bottleneck. And we have more applications that are utilizing CPU and memory so that we are changing our model to be able to say that, you know, how does that impression and, you know, readable and transact impressions correlate to how many servers we will need. Uh, we are actually re re creating a new model for it, but the capacity team is actually working with us to make that happen. Uh, it does take a while to get hardware. Certainly, you have to be ahead of the, ahead of the game, especially in our world where your volume increases quick, quick, very quickly. I'm not sure if that, I fully answered your question, but. Adam, how much time do we have? This is our last question of the evening. I'm right here. Okay, and we will be here. We will be here hanging out with you guys. So, you know, feel free to come and uh, continue the conversation. Uh, could you share your opinion on uh, using Hadoop Yarn versus Apache Spark as the primary analytics? Yeah, um, I can take a little about it. So, um, if, so the question is, uh, how do you compare Hadoop Yarn versus Spark? So, uh, first, uh, Hadoop Yarn is a decade-old technology. It's very mature, uh, and uh, it's very optimized for MapReduce jobs. So, basically, if you want to do like simple group by aggregations, and if you only need to shuffle your data once, uh, no other technology can beat up. Do. 
So Spark um, is a relatively new technology uh, in uh, developed in UC Berkeley, and uh, it is now the one of the biggest community on Hadoop ecosystem. So uh, Spark, on the other hand, is generic framework, uh, and so on our data pipeline, we just started using Spark for some of the jobs. For example, if you do need to shuffle uh, data uh, more than once, if the data has to be shuffled through multiple stages, then Spark can be a good fit. And uh, we do have our optimization and data science team in our uh, in the firm uh, who use Spark to run their ad hoc ad hoc queries um, um, every day. So um, in a nutshell, we do support. Uh, both applications because both MapReduce and Spark uh, have native support on Yarn. Uh, for now, our data pipeline jobs, most of our jobs are uh, very like batch oriented, uh, high throughput, and uh, most of the fundamental jobs we run, we think MapReduce is a, a better fit. We do see basically more and more uh, you know, internal teams, um, you know, new jobs created, they are utilizing Spark. They are utilizing basically that as much as possible. So you, you do see, see the shift. Will you please join me in giving a round of applause to this team for presenting?